I'm really delighted to welcome you to the um, third of the Texa Cradle webinars and implications of generative artificial intelligence for higher education. And this is a look backwards over the last six months or so um, since ChatGPT was released. And, and we've, we've, of course, been made aware of all the other generative AIs and all the other ones that have come on board since this time. And it just feels like a very few minutes ago that um, it was February and ChatGPT was just hitting, a, hitting, hitting, the, hitting the sector and now we've had um, a full semester, trimester through. We're starting to see how staff and students are responding. So I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Um, before we begin, um, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the unceded land, skies and waterways in which deacon students and teachers come together as we learn and teach through virtually and physically constructed places across time. We pay our deep respect to the ancestors and elders of Wadawaran country, Eastern Ma country and the Wurundjeri country, as well as the traditional custodians of all lands on which you may be teaching and learning and where education has taken place for many thousands of years. And um, I think it's really timely to remember in this time of you know, generative AI and who knows what's around the corner and et cetera, that education has taken place for many thousands of years and that things continue on um, into the future um, with or without uh, the latest technology. And of course, please feel free to put the country on which you're in. I know many people have already into the chat. So um, just a reminder of where we're up to the first webinar, chat GPT, what do we need to know now? And some very sort of pointy observations right in the sort of, oh my goodness, um, what are we doing? What is a large language model sort of thing? Um, there's been so many more articles and explainers since and webinars since that point, some excellent ones and some wonderful colleagues around the country have been running many. Um, the next webinar, How Should Educators Respond to ChatGPT, took a particular teaching and learning perspective. And this one, webinar three, takes a look backwards to say what we've learned. And uh, there will be webinar four, which is around research and uh, research conduct. And that's tentatively scheduled for the 18th of July. So that's also something to um, look forward to. There are three channels for conversations, Q&A, and I can see there are some Q&As already, amazingly. Um, ask questions of our panellists. Please use the upvote function and not all questions will be answered. That's been our experience last time because we've had, you know, mm -mm, tens, dozens of questions, can't get through them all. But please put yours in and please upvote people's that you like. The chat, which will be left on, it's ridiculously. Um, Joe Ty, my wonderful colleague Joe Ty, will be semi-monitoring it, but it moves so fast it's impossible to do it properly and we won't redistribute the chat, only the links within it. And if you want to go to Twitter, there's some handles and a hashtag for you. Having done this a few times now, it's my third time, I can. I now have frequently asked question, is this recorded? Yes, it will be released on YouTube. Will the slides be made available? Yes, we will provide the slides with presenter approval, and I think one of our presenters is not using slides, so we won't provide those. And will the chat be made available? No, only the links within the chat will be circulated. Um, so um, I think I may have already answered one of the questions in... Um, in the uh, in in the um, Q and A, and as this is an FAQ, if someone asks those questions in the chat, could you please respond to them because you've seen them? I sometimes people join late and they will they will come in again and say, "Are oh, the slides available?" etc. Completely understandable, but please share the love. The format. Um, so first hour, each speaker has five to eight minutes. They may go a little bit over, they may go a little bit under. Other speakers ask questions. Other than the second hour, we open up to 30 minutes of Q&A. We'll have a formal close and 30 minutes of extended open Q&A. Fairly straightforward. So now on to the actual proceedings. I've, as I've mentioned, it's been six months or so since ChatGPT landed. I think came the end of November. Um, and in that time, uh, there's been absolute response 
And I was at a um, forum on the on um, artificial intelligence last week that was run here at Deakin, um, and it was uh, an AI forum for people who'd been working in AI, and, and clearly um, ChatGPT was was uh, was just a, a minor point on this. And there was a panel a panelist there who said, "This is the most overhyped technology in my um, experience of technology release." So it was quite interesting to hear AI people's perspectives. Other people didn't share that view. Um, any which way, there has been a huge social change, and it has obviously affected how we are learning and teaching. Even the way we are talking about it must be affecting it. So I'm really excited to hear from our panellists today to actually reflect on what some of those changes are and what are the challenges still ahead of us. Um, I don't think this is like any form of big social technological change. It will take some time to work its way through the, through the system as we work out what this means for us uh, as communities and society more generally. So I'd like to welcome our expert panel. Um, Dr. Helen Gamil is Director of Texas Higher Education Integrity Unit, Professor Rowena Harper, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, um, Education Professor at Edith Cowan University and also an, um, an academic integrity researcher, um, Professor Simon Buckingham-Shum, Professor of Learning at Inform Inform Informatics and Director of Connected Intelligence Centre and uh, a, a deep um, expertise also in um, um, computer-mediated feedback. Um, Professor Philip Dawson from Deakin University with me at Cradle, the Centre for Research and Assessment in Digital Learning. And you know what? I think I've got to introduce myself and myself, Margaret Beerman, also from Cradle, the Centre for Research and Assessment in Digital Learning. Um, and uh, Phil is Professor and Co-Director of at Cradle and an, uh, an expert in many things, including um, uh, assessment security. So um, really looking forward to this conversation today and we're going to start off with uh, Helen. So Helen, I've asked you to share your slides. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, hi, everybody. It's fantastic to have so many people here with us today. Um, just give me a moment while I share my slide and hoping that you can see that and just see that in the main presentation mode. So. Um, Margaret, thank you so much for that, that really fantastic acknowledgement of country. I really appreciate that. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people today, and I'd also like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so it's great to see so many people jumping on to join us today for this third webinar. And I'd like to um, acknowledge Margaret and the Cradle team's fantastic work in bringing these um, panels together. And also, of course, thank my fellow panellists for giving up their time to share their expertise and experience today. So in the, the first webinar back in February, I talked a little bit about what TEXA does. And just briefly, TEXA is Australia's independent regulator of higher education. And our two key aims are to um, uphold the quality, reputation and standing of Australia's higher education awards and also to protect the interests of students. In February's webinar, I talked a lot about the various threshold standards, our legislative framework, that I felt were particularly relevant to the conversation about generative artificial intelligence. And today, when Margaret gave us our brief of, of thinking about the three key points of what we've learned and where we think the conversation is going, to me, it was really two that I focused in on. And so I'm paraphrasing these, but the first requirement is that methods of assessment are consistent with the learning outcomes being assessed and the level of study. And the second legislative requirement is that students are only awarded a degree when they've demonstrated achievement of the learning outcomes. So those were the, the two standards that I particularly have in mind when I'm having these conversations around the country and with international colleagues. But I actually want to keep my remarks fairly brief today because I really think um, most of us want to hear from the rest of the panel who are within our institutions and really grappling with this at the moment. So I guess the first thing that occurs to me when I think about what we've learned is that acceptance came really quickly. I've lost count of the number of conversations I've had where people have said, well, generative AI is here, it's not going away, so we just have to accept it and teach students how to use it and how to QA the output. And 
I don't disagree with any of that, but if I were to mark it as an answer, I'd give it partial credit because it's true, but it's incomplete. Um, I really think we now have to really seriously grapple as an entire sector with the transformational piece. It's absolutely critical. So what does this actually mean for our learning outcomes, which most of which for most courses in most institutions were approved by their academic governance processes in a, in a pre-AI um, context? So are those learning outcomes still relevant? Are they the right ones? What are we assessing and how are we doing it and how are we ensuring that it has the integrity and the individual integrity that allows us to say this student has earned this degree? And second, of course, when I think about that is that the context really matters. So there is very much a discipline focus here. Different disciplines are going to have to grapple with this at, at the level that we're all grappling, but then also with specifically what it might mean for their particular discipline. And I think there's a cohort effect that we're going to see magnified because the further we move away from that point in November when, when the large language models were released into the wild, every new cohort entering our institution is going to have a different level of confidence and experience um, and expectation about how and when they use these language models to support them. Secondly, I would say um, the pace of change is increasing. So two and a half years ago, we had uh, the pandemic, which necessitated that wholesale um, shift to online learning. And the dust had barely settled from that. And I certainly don't think I'd say that we we're at the point where we were at full optimization of that when ChatGPT was released. And while we were all grappling with that, the model became more sophisticated and the tech arms race merged with different platforms releasing their own language models and competing to make them better, stronger, more sophisticated. Um, and so, you know, when I think about well, what's that going to mean for the future, obviously I think courses may quickly become outdated, particularly those in the information technology and communication discipline. And it means that institutions need to grapple with how they can make their own course approval processes um, more agile. Because I think if, if we're not able to move away from that five to seven year comprehensive review cycle in a way that still maintains, you know, the, the very important quality and, and governance of that process, then I think there's a real risk of less formal forms of learning just coming in and um, really cannibalising those enrolments because they can be so much more responsive. So I think there's a real need for institutions to become more agile because the methods of assessment are going to need regular retooling along with potentially the content itself. And of course, I mean, we do tend to focus in on the teaching and learning aspect, but AI is going to impact all manner of processes. There's already a lot of administrative processes within the large institutions that are being supported by AI. And so the volume of data and also the types of data that institutions are collecting and monitoring may well look quite different. And, and there's also then a capacity issue to grapple with about do we have the right staff who can make sense of that. And finally, then thinking about um, all that I've said before, institutional leaders really must see themselves as enablers. I think that the professional development staff is going to become absolutely crucial, not just academic staff. Um, I'm quite surprised at how often when I talk to people um, around the world who are in positions such as mine or within institutions, there's still a, a really large number of people who have never tried out the technology for themselves, never had a demonstration of it, um, think it only writes in English, think it's only good for writing essays. So those of us who are really engaged with the issue um, shouldn't assume that everyone has the level of understanding that we have about what the technology can and can't do. And so it's really crucial that we move to acceptance, we don't forget that there's a whole range of people who are, may not have a deep knowledge about what it is that we're accepting. Um, institutional leaders, the people who manage and govern our institutions really need to ensure that there's sufficient and ongoing support for the transformational piece, really um, time consuming, expensive, deep work that needs to take place, especially to make sure that it's embedded consistently. So of course, there's already pockets where there's great things happening and people who are really skilled are developing really interesting assessments, but it's a question of consistency then and how we get that across an entire sector and across all the disciplines. Um, and how we monitor that, monitor that implementation to ensure consistency. Um, 
in the first webinar, I said that responding to generative AI was a marathon and not a sprint. And I'd like to double underline and bold that statement today. It absolutely is and is going to require ongoing commitment. Um, so again, it's just really crucial that our institutional leaders are recognising, engaging and mitigating the risk um, while also making great use of all the exciting opportunities ahead of us. But as I said, I want to keep mine brief, so I'm going to leave it there, Margaret. Thank you. Thanks so much, Helen. Um, I'm going to ask any of the panel if they have any questions to ask. I have a couple of questions I, I'd like to share, them, but I'll see if, if others want to want to ask anything first. Phil? Yeah, um, thanks so much, Helen. It's really great to get your perspective from sort of inside Texar of that. You started out by referring to those standards, and I, I love those standards. They're they're really wonderful ones that embolden me as an assessment researcher. Would you say we we do a great job of that that second one that you raised already? And have we been doing a great job of it? Because like if you weren't in the room, I might say some universities have in the past graduated students who have not met all of the learning outcomes, but I wouldn't say that with you around. <laughs> Yeah, look, I think there's always a risk of any of those standards not being met. So I'm sure that that's absolutely true. And, you know, a big part of the work that you and I and all those other experts collaborated on to do with academic integrity and contract cheating was, was to do with those standards as well. I think the difference here is that I get the sense sometimes talking to people that there's a real fatalism about it. Of, well, we just kind of can't ensure that anymore. So, oh, well, we're going to live in a kind of a world where you just, that's not relevant anymore. And I think it is relevant. And that's when I say we really have to grapple with, with those questions. Um, and it's true to say that a lot of assessment practices that were already not great um, and have been shown up to be really, really not fit for purpose in this age. So, yeah, I think it's true, but I what you're saying, but I think it's um, probably become pointier as a result of these models being released. Oh, thanks so much. Sort of a little bit similar. My question was, as someone who works in the sector, um, you mentioned the word agile in the same phrase as university. And <laughs> some people might say, there's kind of attention there. I mean, and actually, I don't mean that in any way to be disparaging. Universities are large, complex organisations. They are, you know, ocean liners. They're not rowboats. They don't pivot easily. I wondered if you had any thoughts about that kind of tension. And, um, you know, it, it's a word that's very easy to kind of to suggest. But what 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 would you be thinking in terms of, you know, the great ocean liner of the university? Well, yeah. the smaller providers might have it easier, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I think small providers may have it easier internally, but of course, most small providers have to have tech to approve their courses, so they get mired in government bureaucracy um, as well. So, yeah, the legislation also, you know, doesn't allow us to pivot quickly, and I think we're all learning, but I do think within institutions, a lot of the governance processes are, are simply reflecting a different time and a different age. Um, we have to have the quality, but, but we really do, I think, have to take a step back now and say, what are the key objectives and what's the minimum viable product? We have to maintain the quality, but there's a real sweet spot with governance. You can absolutely over-govern things, and I think sometimes that's, that's where institutions fall into having, you know, five different levels of committee that everyone has to go through for everything. Um, and perhaps there's something that needs to emerge that is the, the lighter touch assessment review that, that, under, that is more nimble, that happens at a lower level of governance, doesn't need to go all the way to academic board every semester just because we've realised that that assessment was not very effective. Yeah, that's a, I, I, I appreciate that. That's I mean, it's almost a bureaucratic response to a bureaucratic problem, if you like. Yeah. Um, the, the, the agility needs to come within the bureaucracies rather than the institution as a whole. Um, any panellists, any other questions for Helen? Um, I um, will, I, I do have more questions, but I will, with, I will restrain myself and uh, invite, um, thank you, thank you very much, wonderful to hear from you and wonderful to hear what, you know, where Texas position is sitting with this. Um, and I'd like to invite Rowena. Um, to share her slides. Thanks, Margaret, and thanks, Helen. Uh, 
I'm coming to you all from Wajak Nugabuja here in Western Australia. I'm just focusing as I share my slides. I hope you can see those. I think you can. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to dive right in because seven minutes isn't a long time. Uh, and I'm going to start with what I think the sort of key thing is that we have learned in the last five months or so since that first TEXA webinar, which is around ethics and privacy. Um, so while I'm bringing very much the sort of academic governance perspective to you from my role as Deputy Vice-Chancellor Education, one of the things I've seen in the last five months really touches on a point that Helen made, which is a recognition that while our educational portfolios, I think we're sort of the first to respond to the potential threats of AI, there is now a recognition, I think, across most universities that we really need to be looking in all corners of the organisation around the effects um, of AI on the work that we do in universities. So for me, ethics and privacy are emerging as really significant areas in which we've got a lot to learn. We're seeing some of AI's originators and early advocates coming out now urging criticality and caution around the technologies themselves and how we apply them. You might have seen two recent news stories about AI use in professional contexts, which have highlighted the potential need for legislation or guidance. Stories like this, one from health and one from law, highlight that people in all professions are exploring how to use these tools to make their jobs easier. And this will apply to universities as well if we think about our staff in our student services or our professional services. So beyond thinking about learning, teaching and assessment, universities really need to embed considerations of AI and particularly ethics and privacy into all their activity, including research and operational activities. So the whole university whole organisation, everything it does could be affected by this. So it does need that, that um, rigorous oversight and guidance. ChatGPT and other tools were free and available to access to begin with. But we've now seen the introduction of tiered subscription models and waiting lists for some tools. So access and equity really have to be carefully considered, uh, in my view, before we can start integrating AI into assessment at scale. Every teacher needs to ensure that every student can get reliable access to any tool that's being used for an assessment piece. Having said that, there will be an AI literacy divide if universities don't enable and support the use of AI for all students. We're starting to see this debate arise in the school sector, where some state school sectors have banned uh, AI in schools, but some individual schools are waiving that, so we're starting to see that divide emerge. So this, this can't just be a student responsibility. Universities may need to think about licensing at scale. In fact, they will need to think about licensing at scale for any tool that proves to be important for learning. And I think that analysis has to be done down at the discipline level to look at what tools we really want to be scaling up the use of, what's valuable for learning, research, professional practice. I think um, AI, though, um, with, there's a question that's already popped up about Microsoft Copilot, I think, in the Q&A. AI is now being integrated into everyday work tools. So these are a really logical place to start for me in AI education for staff and students. On academic integrity, and I probably couldn't go without saying something about academic integrity, one thing, if I think about what was easy and what was hard over the last five months, and we, we were invited to think about that as panellists, one thing that was relatively easy over the last five months was to incorporate AI into referencing guides. And I think most universities did that uh, through, their, through their libraries or whoever owned their referencing guides. The issue is that this is appropriate when students have copied text or information from an AI tool, but this doesn't reflect the range of ways that students use AI. This is one simple framework from EDUCORS that highlights how it's used for idea generation, developing outlines or proofreading, none of which can be referenced in the traditional sense. In other words, we've sort of got a band-aid solution for now in terms of acknowledging the use of AI, but we can see it's not fit for purpose and we'll need a, a more appropriate approach. In the longer term, many people have raised programmatic assessment as the direction we'll need to take to ensure integrity. It will take a, a sector level movement to enable the kind of authentic, integrative, 
programmatic assessments required. So many of our structures in and across universities are based on assessment at the unit level. If we think about credit and recognition of prior learning and academic progression, a dedicated and collaborative effort will be needed to enable any step away from those kinds of baked in structures. And I, I think about the, the Office for Learning and Teaching, you know, if, if they were still around, they would be funding, they would be commissioning grants on programmatic assessment right now. So in the absence of the Office for Learning and Teaching, how might we bring together a group that can work across the sector to advise on and enable and move forward on this issue of programmatic assessment? With my final few minutes, I just want to share some data from a student survey that we ran at ECU back in March. It got about 1,500 responses and we we wanted to understand at ECU student awareness of AI usage and also sentiment. So I just want to share the key takeaways in those areas for you now because I, I think I'm starting to see more student voice emerge now in the media around AI and that's great. But five months ago, there was a bit of a dearth of, of student views on it. So on awareness, about 60% of students had heard nothing or very little of AI back in March. Presumably that shifted now, but I've seen some comments from students in the media saying they hadn't heard of AI until they were accused of using it in an assignment. So we may still be failing to have educative conversations with students about it in some areas. Even in March, though, there was a cohort, about 15% of students who were clearly very tuned into the discourse, and they'd been hearing about it mostly from social media and the news media. In terms of actual usage, the pattern was similar. 50% of students hadn't used it, and a further 30% had only used it once or twice. But you can see there was a small proportion of students who had been using it a bit. When we asked how students were using AI tools, their answers were very informative. Their responses fit a pattern from another study I was involved in about contract cheating, and I think the parallels in the responses are worth thinking about. So some of you might have seen me present on the data from the contract cheating and assessment design study I co-led with Tracy Bretag. With my collaborator, Felicity Prentice, I've been reporting on the qualitative findings from the student survey, and these are also impressed with studies in higher education. In that data, students told us that a vital component of their approach to study is collaborating, collaborating with other students, and they mostly don't see this as cheating. And when they described to us in that data the reasons they collaborate, they told us four things. They said we collaborate to help each other, to learn, to clarify tasks and sometimes to cheat. And it turns out that these are largely the same reasons that ECU students gave for using AI, for help with research, with solving problems and with completing all kinds of tasks, to learn, to translate difficult content into language that can be understood and to patiently answer questions that students feel they can't ask to staff to clarify tasks, to explain instructions and to unpack learning objectives, and sometimes to engage in behaviour that might, depending on the context, be seen as cheating. But I can see over the next six to 12 months, certainly we might be rethinking our definitions around what constitutes cheating as more and more of our writing becomes AI assisted. This is a real grey area now. In addition, though, lots of students were using it for work, for fun, or just out of curiosity. Quite a few students were using it in Dungeons and Dragons and gaming. A mother reported using it to write a letter to her child from the Tooth Fairy after the Tooth Fairy forgot. Uh, another student talked about their partner using it to help write emails for work as their writing skills aren't strong. Importantly, though, only about 30% of users expressed some confidence in using AI ethically. Over 50% were not at all confident, had mixed feelings or felt unable to judge. In terms of sentiment, students were more often excited about the potential of AI than anything else. Worry did appear, but only about half as often as excited. Students were worried that it would make them lazy worried that it would inhibit their development of higher order thinking, things like critical thinking and creativity, and worried about fairness and integrity in assessment. Interestingly, the word however 
appeared more often than worried, which reflected that students had really nuanced views on this. Typically, they were excited or hopeful about some aspects of AI, but had concerns about other aspects, or they suggested it should be used for some purposes, but not others. What really comes through from the students have been using it is how they see this as the new normal. Now, this is now a tool in the world. And in terms of students' views, we need to take its capabilities seriously and recalibrate how we teach and what we teach in response. Um, the, the first student um, it's first student quote you can see here was using it for, for work and you can see the benefits that that student talks through. But I think it's really interesting reflecting on the, the second quote there. Uh, this particular student's view says, um, you know, if a student can solve a problem using ChatGPT, then the student is capable of solving that problem. And I, I, I think in a nutshell, this really puts quite clearly sort of the, the issue that Helen touched on in terms of what are our learning outcomes now? Do we still have the right learning outcomes given they were written in a pre-chat GPT world? And how can we kind of re retool our assessment and retool our learning outcomes to be more fit for purpose? So I'm going to end it there. Fantastic. Thank you, Rowena. And so lovely to hear That's the student's voice. voice. It looks like you have a question, <laughs> Helen. <laughs> I have like a hundred questions, but I'm going to try and limit it to just one or two. Um, Rowena, one of the things I've really been grappling with is, you know, talking to people within institutions and then saying, you know, like almost talking as though students come to us as empty vessels as opposed to coming to us at the end of at least 13 years of education. Do you think we need stronger and better linkages between the secondary and tertiary system in, in the wake of this? Uh, yes, I think we do. Uh, at, um... I was part of a session that, that me and some of my ECU colleagues gave for secondary teachers in Western Australia, and they were they were tearing their hair out, first of all, that Western Australia was one of those school systems that had banned the use of it in schools. Mm -hmm. um, secondary teachers were really keen to engage in this, you know, engage their students in conversations around this and start incorporating it into their teaching. Um, they were worried about... Um, the big leap students would therefore need to make between high school and university if we were embracing this at university, but it was banned in high school. So, yes, I think short answer, yes, we, we do need, uh, I think, a more joined up approach uh, across the education system around it. And can I ask a second question just before Simon asks you? So well, the bit that really ties me in knots, and I'm just, you know, it's not yours to solve alone. I'm just curious about whether you have any thoughts on it because we keep talking about students interrogating the output and more and more I hear people already deferring, like the machine must be smarter, it's a machine, therefore it's right. But I really worry about the ability of students 10 years from now to interrogate the output when they don't have the content knowledge or if they find it hard to develop the content knowledge because they're reliant on just prompting the AI. Yeah, I, I think... Um, it is a really difficult one. I, I could see in a lot of the student comments that a really high degree of criticality in what the, uh, the students in the qualitative data from ECU were saying. They were, they were really reflecting on the quality of the output. So I could see a lot of students saying, oh, yeah, the output wasn't that great. The output, I could have written something better. Um, so, so I think it's promising that that is clearly there quite strongly um, in students. I think I think what you're saying, though, is there a risk that over time that the student's ability to engage critically starts to wane? Well, I think that's really on us and educators. I, I, I think that is going to be a very difficult question to answer for each discipline, which is what do my students need to know to be able to enact critical thinking around the outputs of these tools. I think that has to remain a learning outcome, um, but designing that in and teaching that, I, I think, is, um, uh, is, is a difficult question to answer, how, how we do that. Simon? Um, just picking up, perhaps it's picking up on the same point Helen was making, uh, Rowena, but it's really interesting if a student says, look, if I can solve it, I can solve it. You shouldn't care how I did it, isn't it? Now. That is the the intriguing question, I think, is whether we're going to see uh, students hit the ceiling at some point because they've managed to get through with AI support, but at some point they it's going to become apparent they have not mastered some foundational knowledge and they will not be in a position to critique what, uh, what the AI is saying at 
at some point. So that, that's an empirical question. It may well be disciplinary specific and stage specific, but that is that is the empirical question, the research question that we need to investigate, whether students will still master the foundation knowledge they need to then be critical engagers with AI, or whether we have just torpedoed their learning inadvertently. I think the other piece of criticality students will need to develop is that um, and all of us will need to develop is we we need to understand how the tools that we are using actually work. How is the information generated? Because often you can actually begin there in thinking through whether the output is robust or not, and in what context the output might be useful or not. Ah, Phil, very last question. All right. Um, I, I find it really interesting that we project a future by default where these things get better and better and are available forever and the planet doesn't burn due to climate change and there's no techno-dystopian society to worry about. Um, did, did you get any of that, come on guys, the planet's burning, this AI shit's got, not going to be around forever sort of vibes there? I, not not that I recall, not that I recall. I might dig into the comments to see if I can find anything like that again. Um, but no, I, I have to say I'm I'm with you, Phil, that that I do think we have some really big burning questions to to respond to as universities and to help our students respond to. I think social justice matters are one, climate change, another. You know, there are these big kind of social and economic issues that I think if we get too derailed by thinking about chat GPT or AI as an issue in and of itself, um, then we're not really thinking about how to kind of orient its use towards solving these much, much bigger problems. So, yeah, I, I think that um, the let's not lose sight of those big things. I, I'm totally with you. Did I see it in the student sentiment? Not strongly, but but I'm going to go back in and Thank you so much, Rowena. As I said, fabulous to hear the students' views and from also that sort of um, that, that that view from the from looking down at the university as well, too. Well, not that you look down ever. Um, Simon, I think you are next. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Margaret. Um, great to be back here and reflecting on where we've got to. Okay, um, I'm going to briefly reflect on what have we learned as well as what do we need to learn next? Um, what's been happening in the last three months since our last webinar? Well, if you're like me, every morning is exciting. You wake up and read uh, amazing new reports about what GPT is technically capable of doing. So we see many people demoing exciting things, and we're starting to see a few systematic evaluations of that. We'll, we'll take a look at one of those in a moment. The next step is the educators go from there to saying, okay, that's exciting. How do we turn that into a student activity? So there are many ideas out there amongst educators for how you integrate uh, ChatGPT or some variant of that into a student task. And then to a lesser but emerging extent, we're starting to see how what happens when you actually do that. So it's one thing to have a million and one ideas about bright things we might do with ChatGPT, who's actually doing it, and, and, and we're starting to see stories emerging from the field. I'll tell you some of those stories, uh, and no doubt there are research papers in press as we speak. Okay, going back to this one, here's an example from uh, my learning analytics colleagues at Monash. They have published a, a very nice peer-reviewed study, can large language models write reflectively? Um, and um, the answer is uh, yes, they can. In fact, they can do that better than students, judging by uh, the grades that educators gave those texts. Intriguingly, academics are really poor at actually spotting the texts written by the humans. An AI classifier that the authors developed was better than educators at distinguishing chat GPT from students' reflective writing. So an interesting study in itself, an example of the kind one class of research, which is evaluating its technical capabilities from an educational perspective. But this is not about introducing it into teaching practice as such. If we take the second uh, stream of work, this is academics proposing how we might use this in pedagogically effective ways. Here's an example from my former colleague at the Open University, Mike Sharples. Um, 
Many of you may have seen this, very well worth a look if you haven't. You can see uh, a range of roles that he is proposing ChatGPT can play, and there are prompts to give it these roles that he provides. Here's the explanation of what it means, and here's an example of how you implement that. And uh, you can follow the link to learn more about this. Okay, so that's a, an example of a, a pedagogically motivated approach from uh, uh, an, an, uh, an educational innovation expert. This is how we might use it in sensible ways. Okay, what we need to do from the kinds of work that Mike and Ethan Mollick and so many other educators working in this space is we need to map what then happens. So now we're into the piloting and evaluation phase. So if we take Mike's chat GPT roles as an example, uh, what we would expect to see perhaps is this kind of evidence map emerging where we start to take those roles and they, we see them deployed in different contexts. Disciplinary contexts, school kids versus first years in university versus master's students, and we will see varying degrees of success and failure. And if we were to do this, there's absolutely nothing to stop us coordinating our activities to say, and of course, this is completely made up data, so don't read anything into the heat map, right? But the possibility engine in my hallucinated heat map is translating very well across multiple contexts, whereas the Socratic opponent seemed to work only well in one context. Context three, for some reason, seems to be remarkably amenable to multiple kinds of uh, roles for chat GPT. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that we, we need to be seeing much more of now as we start to see anecdotes and stories from the trenches turn into more rigorous research. And what we are seeing in all of our institutions, I'm sure, is um, that educators are now beginning to be able to articulate what chat GPT literacy looks like. They can they have a sense of what the range of ability is within their cohort, and they're beginning to gain insights into how to better scaffold their students. So, for example, I've been talking to some of my most uh, exciting colleagues here at UTS, asking them, tell me how you're using chat GPT, and in particular, What's the capacity to engage critically with its output, which is something we hear a lot about all the time. Three months ago, we really couldn't articulate what that looked like. Now we can. So let me give you four glimpses of uh, what some of my colleagues were saying to me. Here's Shabani Antonet teaching applied NLP to data science master's students. They have to write a critical summary and a visual map of ethical issues in using NLP. They're encouraged to use ChatGPT for various reasons. Uh, purposes and to reflect on it for their uh, on their use of it and how useful it was. So the most able students, she tells me, could engage in deep conversations with AI, and they were using excellent prompts and follow up uh, replies to the agent. Whereas the less able students were using simple prompts to access content, they didn't have deeper discussions with the AI. Here's Baki Kokabali teaching interaction design. And the students are using GPT to develop user personas, scenarios, ideate new solutions, and reflect, reflect critically on that. Capacity to engage critically? Well, the most able students were doing this. They were generating rich scenarios with ChatGPT, um, yet not seeing any critical reflection on what made an AI output an appropriate or accurate response. And Barkey is reflecting that this may be something to do with the subjective nature of design practice. Um, we might want to come back to these disciplinary differences um, that have already been referred to, uh, I think, by Helen. Um, the less able students, they could still get some good responses, but not much good reflection going on. And he notes that he needs to provide more scaffolding and examples for the students. So we see this, this, this professional learning as well amongst the teachers. Here's Anna Lindforst Linkfist. She is training student teams to work together to build robots, and again, encouraging their use of chat GPT and reflecting critically on it. The most able students could use it, and I won't even read all of these things out, they're using it in quite fluent and effective ways. But the less able students, she, she notes they're, they're, they're not really validating and checking GPT's calculations. They're struggling to apply information in the context of the project. Some actually just drop GPT altogether. It's just too much work to actually get it to do anything useful. And a final example from Bezad Tai, 
year two and three students. They're using ChatGPT, but they're also using a simulation tool called Plexus to analyze soil structure interaction problems. Okay, the most engaged students were behaving like this. The least engaged students were struggling and were behaving like this. So again, the point is less the detail here. The point is that our academics are starting to know what does good look like? What can I expect from my students? Um, there is clearly a diversity of ability to engage critically with a conversational generative AI. And we need to step back from these particular examples and ask, okay, what are gonna be the foundational concepts uh, and evidence as it grows around what we could call generative AI literacy for learning, not for marketing, not for any other purposes that can be useful for learning. Um, conversational agents are not new in the world of education. They've been around in the AI ed research literature for, for donkey's years. But used well, they should move us towards more dialogical learning and feedback. So we're all used to th thinking about student peer feedback learning designs. They're now going to be interacting with agents. Those agents will be interacting with them and potentially with other agents as well, playing different roles. And we will learn how to orchestrate these agents and define the roles they need to play. And every turn in this conversation is a, it's a form of feedback. The question is, what move does the student make next? How do they engage with that feedback from humans and machines? And we have concepts and evidence from pre-generative AI research around this. We have concepts such as student feedback literacy. And we have been taking inspiration from that and talking about student automated feedback literacy now. There is the notion of teacher feedback literacy as well. And similarly, we're working on teacher automated feedback literacy. A few references for you there. So these are powerful concepts, I think, for helping us think about how do we study and equip students to engage in powerful learning conversations? The final point I want to make is we need to work with our students. We've been working with our students association here at UTS. We had over 150 applicants for a a workshop where we took a stratified sample of 20. They engaged in pre-workshop readings where we presented them with a range of dilemmas involving ChatGPT and Turnitin, uh, took part in online discussions and had a face-to-face -face workshop. They took briefings from UTS experts, introducing generative AI, explaining how it's being used creatively at UTS, such as the examples I just showed you, um, talking about the ethical issues around generative AI, and talking about Turnitin, what do we know about it? And should we turn it on? That is a decision we're trying to make at UTS at the moment. Breakout groups, a plenary discussion, and we have a report currently under review by the students as to whether they, ha they are happy with that as a summary of what they talked about. But let me just share three examples of what they told us, and you'll see some echoes here with what we heard from Rowena. Firstly, please equip us to use ChatGPT for learning. We are aware that it could actually undermine our learning if we don't use it, use it well, but what does that mean? You're, you're the educators. You should be able to tell us how to use it effectively for learning and not in a way that torpedoes our learning. Please, can we have more assessments integrating ChatGPT in sensible ways? Um, and uh, they were very excited to see the examples such as the ones I showed you. Uh, because not all of them have experienced that yet. And finally, turn it in. Well, yes, it may have a role to play as part of an overall approach to academic integrity, but please handle with care. If there are any questions about our academic integrity, we wanna be called in for a, res a respectful conversation um, and not be accused of misconduct when, as we are already hearing, turn it in are backing off from some of their original claims about how good their software is. It's a very fast moving arms race. So just to wrap up then, three things, three questions about what we need to learn next. What do we mean by generative AI literacy and how do we scaffold it? How well do generative AI learning designs translate across contexts? They may look very promising, but we have to actually deploy those and study them in context. And finally, how are we gonna engage our students in co-designing this radical shift with us. 
We talk a lot about diversity of voices in the design of AI. We absolutely need them on board, trusting the way we're using this technology, seeing that we're using it responsibly and ethically, and bringing the perspectives that they have. They're the ones on the receiving end of all this policy we're talking about. All right, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Simon. And again, so fabulous to hear student voices at play and to hear what the staff are doing. It sort of, it makes it so concrete to have those, those terrific examples. Um, I, I think we've got time for one quick question for Simon before we move on to Phil. Anyone on the panel want to want to ask anything? Um, I'm wondering against all of this how much you do think disciplines have a role to play. You did, you've mentioned it once. You mentioned a couple of things in there that I think are super important, student ability, um, disciplinary difference. How do we tackle things we already do poorly working across disciplines, working at different student abilities? How do we tackle some of those conundrums? In 20 seconds? Um, <laughs> okay, look, so... Um, one answer, one way of thinking about this is what are the demands of the of the sector and the employers out there? What kinds of fluent literacy will they be expecting from our graduates? And how will our graduates be disadvantaged when they go to compete for jobs if they're up against students who are flying these machines to their limit and they also understand where their own creativity and ethical thinking and expertise adds value on top of what can be automated. So that's one way of answering the question is, it, you know, it's an ethical issue that we talked about in the workshop. If the university fails to equip students to compete for jobs out there against students who were equipped, that's one way of answering it for sure. Um, there, are, there are many other angles on that. Uh, and nor should we just be dancing to the tune of industry and what they are demanding, of course, that university is about far more than that. They need to be challenging and questioning the way that industry and business operates. That's why we're in the meta crisis we're in as we speak that Phil was referring to, of course. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and uh, so I'll quickly now hand over to Phil. And my microphone works now. Um, I'd like to just start off by saying that I'm in Calgary in Canada. So I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta and also acknowledge that the city of Calgary, where I am, is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, which is Treaty Region 3. Um, so I, I have sort of three big points to talk about. I'll tell you what they are first. Uh, the first one is that we now have evidence that generative AI is capable of so much of what we set for students. The second one is that generative AI detection is not quite there yet, and it might never be. And the third one is that more than ever, we really need multiple moments of assessment to evidence any one learning outcome. We can't really rely on just one assessment anymore, not that we ever could. Um, for that first point, that we now have evidence that Gen AI is capable of so much of the work that we set for students, I'd like to just chuck a couple of uh, papers into the chat. So these two papers are really interesting evidence that we've seen over the past six months where people have tried generative AI out on a couple of different types of tasks. So the Gilson and colleagues paper is chat GPT on the US medical licensing exam. Uh, and they found that, yeah, it appears to perform at the level of a third year medical student. Now, a bit of a, a disclaimer on that one. It's a closed book exam that they're trying chat GPT out on. So not exactly um, sort of a totally authentic scenario, but it, it does, you know, sort of suggest some scary and possibly some wonderful things. I really like this Australian paper by Nikolik and colleagues. Um, it's a huge lot of Australian engineering educators as the authors from a lot of different unis. And they found that in engineering, ChatGPT can do some tasks we currently set pretty well. It also can't do some well. But as um, I think James Marnie in the chat said, generative AI is currently the least capable it'll ever be. 
you know, with the disclaimer, as I said before, that the planet is burning, we could be on the brink of global conflict, uh, we could be entering some sort of techno dystopia, but we do need to think where we are now is, is probably not the best this stuff is ever going to be. So that's sort of my first point. Oh, yeah, and Joe's mentioned I have no slides. I have no slides. Yes. Uh, my second point is that generative AI detection is not quite there yet, and it might never be. People have proposed a lot of systems to deal with this, but they have problems. Some report accuracy rates, but there's no third-party validation of those accuracy rates. You know, no third-party researchers are going in and seeing if these things work, kind of like with remote proctoring tools. Uh, but that's a different conversation. Um, there is a preprint paper, and I'll just chuck that in the chat, that makes a mathematical argument that detecting chat GPT and generative AI in general, large language models, are possibly theoretically not possible. Um, it's, it's not peer reviewed yet. It's, I'd like to hold judgment until it's been properly peer reviewed, but it's, it's interesting. But I guess more broadly, we've seen people just trying out some of these tools on real live student data, something on, um, oh gee, I am reading in the chat, people are like, oh no, Phil's not posting the things to everyone. All right, here we go. I will put them in. All right, I'm just experiencing technical difficulties. I'm gonna continue and make sure you get these papers I refer to. Um, yeah, so I, I guess we've seen people uploading stuff to ChatGPT and saying, hey, ChatGPT, did you write this? Or some random thing on GitHub or Hugging Face and saying, oh, gosh, you know, did this student write this? And we've seen articles in the US media about people who have done that. Don't do that. If you take one thing from me talking now, just, just don't do that. We don't have students' permission to upload their work to these random sources. Some people go, oh, yeah, Bill, Phil, but, I, you know, like, turn it in. We don't have uh, students' permission on that or whatever. It's a bit of a different one, but I can see the similarities, at least with turn it in or other text matching tools, university solicitors or whatever have been through the terms of service. Students have been advised it's going to happen. These random detectors, no one's approved them. My last point is that more than ever, we need multiple moments of assessment to evidence any one learning outcome. Every single type of assessment brings with it some validity problems. You know, basically how well does this assessment assess the outcomes it aims to assess? There's no perfect type of assessment. Chat GPT vulnerability is one of these. You know, if we're worried students are gonna use chat GPT on a task and we haven't designed it to be chat GPT'd, then yeah, that creates a problem. But contract cheating is another problem that's existed for a while. Uh, validity problems due to exclusion are another type of problem. Tasks that aren't designed for everyone create validity problems. There's all sorts of validity problems with tasks. To account for all these varied validity threats, we just need multiple types of assessment across a degree for any given outcome. Could be a mix of take-home tasks, might have interactive oral assessment, placement, maybe a traditional exam, They've all got validity problems, but together we can hopefully assure learning outcomes better. It's akin to what Rowena was talking about with programmatic assessment, because I'm an assessment person and ultimately my big concern is that we only graduate students who can do what we say they can do and that they're ready for the world that they'll enter. Um, thank you. I will chuck some uh, links into the chat very soon. Thanks so much, Phil. And I, you may not see in the chat someone has typed Phil Swiss cheese. So not, I think not that mine. reason Swiss cheese or Kiara Randall and colleagues Swiss cheese, not Phil's. Not Phil Swiss cheese. It's an it's an old Swiss cheese. The Swiss cheese. Helen, do you have a question for Phil? I do. Um, so Phil, I know you. I read your book about assessment. Um, so I know you think about assessment and the many the many different roles that assessment plays. One of the things that I fear is that we end up with this uncoupling of learning and assessment. Like, like part of why you set assessment is because it tells the students what they really need to know, right, and what they really need to focus on. And there are some disciplines, like my own, I was a scientist and I 
taught in the medical school where, where stu- there is a fair bit of content that actually students do need to know because it's foundational and they can't understand second year molecular biology if they didn't grasp first year and they need to, you know, if they're medical doctors in emergency, there's an instant recall element that is actually required. So how do you, how do you think about the role of assessment in directing learning when you have something like ChatGPT that can do all of that stuff super well? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I, I guess, you know, when I go to the doctor, I don't want them going, uh, the knee bones connected to the leg bone and the leg bones connected to the hip bone or whatever. I, I appreciate the need for automaticity with, you know, the, that lower level knowledge. I think we in Australia, and it's, it's kind of unique because I'm in Canada right now and, and they don't here, but we in Australia are true believers in constructive alignment as a sector, it seems. And I think we we at least in official paperwork think that if you have the learning outcomes and the teaching learning activities and the assessment all in alignment you'll be able to get those lower level outcomes happening and and all of that i i think that will probably work okay but i think there's going to be moments where we really still do need to assess those lower level outcomes the question about assessment and learning and the connection there um there's a also a, a, almost a, a myth around assessment that assessment drives learning. And the evidence isn't as strong for that as um, people might think. And there's a great paper, it's a cradle paper led by Juan Fisher Rodriguez, uh, really trying to grapple with those ideas of to what extent does assessment influence learning. We still need more work there. Um, Does any of the other panellists have any questions for Phil before we all come back on board and we open up to the full full session? Phil, thank you. It's so good to hear those views. And I I, I mean, this this question about, you know, I, I feel like you and Helen are so singing from the same song sheet in terms of what we assess and also this issue of alignment that runs through echoes with um, Rowena's views as well. Could I have the the full panel back on for us all. Thank you. That was just amazing. What a a glorious um, capture of some of the conundrum that we are are dealing with. And I think across um, the four presentations, we saw echoes and also I think some tensions coming out to play a little bit as well too, which I think is, is super interesting. What I think we'll do is we'll jump straight into the Q&A. Um, and um, then I'll, I'll do thank you uh, formally in about 20 minutes' time, and then we'll go on and take some more Q&A. So um, the first question, and and I think it's it's one that's been there for a while and it has 39 upvotes, is what are your recommendations for institutions when Microsoft Copilot launches? Given how long it will take to implement curriculum reform, what should be done in the interim? So there are a couple of suppositions there, but I'll leave them for you to tease out. Does anyone want to jump in? I can jump in. Um, I think uh, there's a few questions in the Q&A that relate to what should we do now, what should we be doing in the next six months? So I do think Helen is right that we need to think about this as a marathon and not a sprint because we will be working on this for, for years to come. But I think at the moment what what I think um, institutions need to do is balance forward momentum with good governance. So, and I think in terms of forward momentum, somebody earlier used the word empower. I I do think we need to be empowering and enabling staff to take some ownership in this space, in their area, and work with some autonomy to start working this into their curriculum and assessment. I think in terms of how long it takes to make changes to curriculum, it's a spectrum. A unit coordinator can walk in and make a change to their curriculum tomorrow if they want to. But changing assessments, depending on the degree to which you're changing an assessment, can take a while to work through a university's governance hierarchy. So it's a kind of a spectrum, if you like, in terms of how long it takes to change the curriculum. But I think um, if we're really wanting to empower and enable staff, I think probably what we need is a combination of some bottom-up learning 
in universities. We need each discipline area to be talking with their students, to be reaching out to their professional and industry bodies, to be looking at what's happening in their space, looking on Twitter and blogs and you know, LinkedIn and tracking what's emerging in their particular discipline area, what tools are being used, because it's not just large language models. AI stretches across tools in every discipline area. So we probably need to step away from a myopic focus on just large language models. So that bottom-up learning, what's happening in each pocket of the university, and some top-down support in terms of some quick policies if we need to mitigate risks, and some guidelines to help empower staff to start using this in their teaching and in and, um, and learning for students and, and assessment practice. So um, I assume every university has been going to the demos of Microsoft Copilot. Um, everyone's keeping an eye on it. Um, it's, if it's going to be integrated into your enterprise tools, this seems a logical place to start to me. So um, because that in terms of equity of access, you know, but that's a really important consideration. So yeah, I think um, I think that kind of bottom up plus some top down, and I, I know um, our university certainly put in place a governance framework around it. We've got a steering committee for the use of generative AI, and sitting under that steering committee, we've got three working groups: one focused on research, one focused on learning, teaching, and student support, and the other focused on organisational productivity. And we're trying to make sure that our IT departments and our legal and risk departments are really well represented across all of that work. So we we just starting to really get going on it now but but I would I would you know really um, imagine that most universities are thinking about that bottom up plus top down approach. Thanks fantastic. Does anyone else want to to chime in or shall we should we go on? I'm getting the the, the mute buttons are left on that's the <laughs> the indication. There's two questions here that are quite similar um, and uh, all around digital slash AI literacies. Um, Colin Simpson writes, universities have discussed the need to develop digital literacy skills for years, but rarely have delivered on this. How can we do better when it comes to developing AI skills? And then there's a comment saying, but in many disciplines, digital literacy is researching using databases. Do we want students to develop the ability to use AI generators in many fields might this detract from research skills, critical thinking and original ideas. There's concern that using AI will diminish diverse voices. And there's also another question just saying how can we do it in a comprehensive manner? And there's some comments here about sort of policies and so forth. And I think I'd like to invite each panellist to speak to this notion of um, developing and enhancing literacies in this in this space. Um, and I'll, do, I'll just start with you, Phil, because you're to the left of my, my hand. Yeah, so I, I agree that we haven't necessarily delivered on digital literacies. So it is, it is a bit of a big ask to now have this whole other set of literacies. I, I think I'd probably start in the shorter term with maybe just capabilities with, with generative AI and that we might want to look at our learning outcomes and see where do we want to build in learning outcomes around capabilities with these tools um, and also the, the interplay between the learning outcomes we currently have and Gen AI. We might want to set them with respect to Gen AI. This learning outcome is to be done with these supports, that sort of thing. I think it's it's such a, like what what is sort of critical Gen AI literacy is such a contested space that I feel like there's sort of work to do in that space to figure out what it is before we try and, and develop it with people. But I wouldn't want that to be a sort of a cause of inaction. Great. Helen, you're next on my screen. Such a, it's such a wicked problem and there's so many different ways I think we could go with it. So I was at a forum um, in Canberra with a heap of government departments and researchers and various people from the secondary system and one of them pointed out that we actually haven't done very well as a whole education sector in implementing the digital literacies that we set down 10 years ago. So I think we've got to be realistic about how long it will take to do this in a comprehensive and, and systematic way. Um, I think it's also... It's, it's also important to keep in mind that whatever we set 
this, this is a very negative thing to say, but, but whatever we said, there will be individuals who try to get around that. So there's still going to be students who try to cheat. You know, in Simon's examples that the most capable students could do really good prompts, for example, you'll still see students outsourcing stuff to contract cheating providers who can say we're really good at prompting the AI for you. So we're still going to have to think about the overlay of those two issues together. And it just, it keeps coming back to that authentic assessment. How do we actually get to a point in which in this landscape, as well as in the one we were already grappling with, that we feel confident that students are, just, are achieving the learning outcomes. And I do think it's that, it's that, I'd like to see us lean into our advantages as a sector. I think we've got the benefits of having a single regulator. We've got the benefits of having lots of really, really intelligent people thinking deeply about this. And we've, we've got to move to a way of joining these people up and starting to really grapple with this issue for the benefit of everyone. Thank you. Rowena, you're next on my screen. Um, yeah, I, I think developing students' digital literacies is always going to start start with developing staff digital literacies because the question is if students are going to learn it, who teaches it? So I think if we've if we've failed to deliver on on digital literacies aspirations, you know, maybe we also need to look at um at our how we've done staff development around it, how we've enabled staff to be teachers of digital literacies. Uh, I think we 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 probably do need at the, at the sector level and and within individual organisations to think more about our professional development of staff. I think not just individual staff, um, not just individual unit coordinators who might bear a responsibility for teaching digital literacies, but I think about team teaching. Where in the organisation does expertise for digital literacies reside? You know, is there a team who can support academic staff? to teach digital literacies in the way, for example, that we might have a careers team that might help staff embed career development learning in their curriculum. Do we have teams around digital literacies that can come and do that embedding work with a staff member? Perhaps we need to think about it that way. Where is the expertise for this going to reside in a university? I think also just um, there was sort of some, some um, points in there that you made, Margaret, about um, the, the risk to creative and critical thinking of tools like these. I think it would be a mistake to think that creative and critical thinking and the use of AI are antithetical. They're not. Okay? AI can be used towards creative and critical thinking. So um, that then has to get rolled in, I think, to how we think about digital literacies, you know, leveraging these things as tools um, to, to, yes, do the drudgery piece, if you think back to that slide that, that I shared from Educores, um, but also the dreaming, the ideation, you know, that, that can be used for a whole range of things and we need to, to help students think through um, to what uses it can be put. Fantastic. Thank you. Simon. Oh, well, this, this is the question, I think, and students are really aware of this, at least the self-selecting group who applied for our workshop work, okay, and that's that's going to be a partial sample, right? But they are really aware that they could use this badly, and they don't just mean get caught or accused by Turnitin. They mean they are aware that they could undermine their own learning. And as educators, we need a sort of developmental model, I think, in certain disciplines and in certain contexts, which might say, yes, this is a power tool for professionals, but you don't give power tools to babies. There are times where you, you, you know, because they're actually going to inflict harm on themselves, right? Now, having said that, some of our students are going to be able to teach us things to do with chat GPT that we don't know how to do. At the same time, we are going to be able to teach them. So I'm going to come back to the student voice here. And it's an old idea, but having students co-design assessments with staff this may be a real opportunity here because there's such collective intelligence when you take the best from both sides and there's mutual learning that needs to happen here as well. And staff are hard pressed and it's hard to keep up with this stuff. So I'll, I'll, I'll wave the flag there for student co-design of assessments because we know how powerful that can be when it's done well. Um, ChatGPT is, is extraordinary in many ways. It still does amazingly stupid things, um, and I've, 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 I've tweeted some of the examples of what the stupid things it was doing, just saying to me a couple of weeks ago, 
but it can also do some extraordinary things like take a conceptual framework, apply it to a piece of writing and structure that writing and identify how that writing is implementing that conceptual framework. You know, it's very impressive, extracting arguments, structuring arguments, identifying moves in reflective writing and so forth. So, you know, um, it for me, yeah, we, it, can, it could end very badly where we have inadvertently undermined students' foundational learning that they will need in order to be critics of AI. Uh, on the other hand, it can enhance their learning and stretch and challenge them. And uh, Ethan Mollick published a great example of how you use the flaws in ChatGPT to promote deeper learning. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. Didn't have time to show that one. But these are the kinds of creative examples that we need. Thank you so much. And I'd love the flag on waving the flag for co-design. I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and say that I would also like to wave the flag for critical digital literacy, slightly different, but the critical angle I think is really, really important. And um, and it joins up some of the digital literacy stuff with the AI stuff, because I think something we haven't been talking enough about and what we need to talk to our students about is data. What data sits under the the um, AI, what happens to our data. It's 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 going to be, um, again, at the AI festival I was at last week, you know, AI um, uh, researchers were talking about um, AI being the uh, data, being the economic moat. So it's not going to be the technology, it's not going to be the algorithms, it's going to be data. And I think the more that we can teach our students about data and how to live in a datafied world with everything that that entails, um, I think I think we're doing uh, a good job, and maybe we should start with ourselves because we honestly sometimes I think <laughs> we are very um, um, not upfront about how much we are affected by and how much we work with data to our students. Um, next question along. I, I, I'm, this is from David Leafsley, and he writes, I recognise as an academic audience, however, why do most students attend university? It's because they believe this will enhance their career prospects and better pay. I, I, I'm not sure I 100% agree with that, but nonetheless. So what do employers think of LLM and AI and what do employers expect university, se university sector to provide in terms of managing student capabilities with AI and delivering more for, for less? Surely the employers and career pathways should assume greater consideration in this debate. So let's not go down the rabbit hole of how much a university education solely contributes to careers, but let's just talk about it's certainly something that, that we do do. It is part of maybe a broken compact, but nonetheless some kind of a compact with students that when they come in there will be employment waiting for them in some way enabled by what, what they've learned here. How should we bring in the employer voice? Anyone want to talk to that? I, I might just briefly mention, I did sort of speak to that briefly in mind. Yeah, I, yeah. I do, and, and earlier, I do think disciplines need to be reaching out to their accrediting bodies, professional industry bodies to ascertain what's happening in the professions with these things. I'm aware also of a couple of accrediting bodies who are already reaching out to universities saying, how are you incorporating this into your curriculum? We, we anticipate that you are. We hope that you are. So I think that's going to vary across disciplines depending on the uh, ethical risks associated with the use of this in a particular professional area. But, yeah, they, they should absolutely be, be a big part of the conversation, definitely. Yeah. Um, oh, Simon, sorry. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, as as these tools embed into industry, and in some sectors they already are, you know, this is not some distant AI future we're talking about. Um, you, you won't be able to compete if you can't use coding tools um, as well as your, as your peers, I think. Their productivity is going up and um, you're just going to be stranded. Um, if you can't use these tools. So it's going to be a sector-specific sector, sector specific response. I think what will be very interesting is if we if we start hearing from employers that graduates are rocking up, unable to do things they did they used to be able to do, <laughs> right? Then we'll know that we've lost the plot somewhere along the line. That's just going to be a feedback loop that will take a little while to come through. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure, Simon, if I am picking up on the same point, but I was thinking about the scaffolding piece that you mentioned, and that that to me is where it all the wheels start to come off a bit down the future. You know, depending on the path it all takes, if we don't think that through really clearly, because yes, it's going to be an immediate expected graduate outcome that students know how to use these tools. But this is just one iteration of the tools and one iteration of where we are now. And so those higher level thinking skills about the ability to adopt whatever the change is, right, to be nimble and to be able to learn new skills or pick up new technology or move into a different context and apply your skills, that's the stuff that I think transcends technology, that we need to make sure we're not torpedoing students' learning and making sure they can still do those things. Yeah, I, I'd really agree. I think there's the the there's the tension of too much Gen AI, not enough Gen AI, which types, or all of that. Um, I I loved the um, the quote that uh, Rowena had from that that student about you know if you can get Gen AI to do it, then you can do it. And and I reckon that might be the case to a degree, but I can get Gen AI to produce stuff that I don't know if it's any good or not. And I, I sort of, I wonder about that with our students, whether we still do need to graduate them with the capability to do all the stuff themselves, but maybe we just don't get them to do it themselves every time, get them to do it enough themselves that they can spot when things have gone awry, but also are really capable of magnifying their sort of potential by using these tools. And I think, Phil, to that point, it's that scaffolding question again. Like a lot of people in the chat are talking about calculators. Well, we don't let prep use them. Right? Students have to learn the fundamentals of mathematics and understand the relationship between you know, addition and subtraction and all of those things before we give them a calculator. So there's a way in which throughout a student learning journey, we introduce concepts and tools at different points. And it is about saying, not you can never use this and this is something that you should avoid, but it's about what are the underpinnings you need to use that thing appropriately? Absolutely. And, and some of the time that's going to be like a traditional scaffolding where we start off by giving you lots of supports that we slowly withdraw. You know, we might actually let students use Gen AI in first year that we don't let them use in fourth year. And then some of it might be sort of a reverse scaffolding where, you know, you only get your, your calculator license or your pen license or whatever once you've mastered those capabilities yourself. Because the example I always give is like, we need the pilot who can fly the airplane when the instruments work and the pilot who can fly the airplane when all the instruments fail. But we don't just want to train them in that condition. We want them to be able to fly in all of the conditions. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to draw a session, the formal part of the session to close here. Um, but, but just to comment on, I mean, I curse the fact that I never did learn my times tables. It has served me very poorly at various points in my life. Um, so there is something to be said for rote learning some basic things as you're sitting there sort of, you know, um, counting stuff up. Um, I, I, I really find this conversation so generative. I think there's so much to go on here and I think that I think that I mean there's comments in the in the in the Q&A and in the chat you know what are we facing here is this a big moment is it a little moment are we overhyped are we underhyped the answer is we kind of don't know and to sort of running through what I'm hearing all of the all of us talking is like this sort of responsiveness to an unfolding situation and I think that responsiveness will go for some time we're taking some stuff back from history we know from history that sometimes these introductions are overhyped and sometimes um you know they're profound and often when they're profound they're profound in unexpected ways so we do need to be on our toes and I, I I think these conversations help us all engage in that and this on our toes for me listening to you all is something we have to share students teachers sector it's not something that you can set and forget and human beings generally in my experience don't like that they like to know where they stand so we're all going to have to live with a little bit more uncertainty I think and um can I thank you then Thank wonderful panellists, formally, such expertise and so good to have this, this quality of this thinking around the problems that we face and um, 
and to hear each of your perspectives, you know, regulatory, sort of like the educational ed tech perspective, the um, institutional perspective, thinking, you know, across those levels, students, staff, everything in between, Phil, the assessment researcher perspective, and all those tensions that run between, you know, how we need to assure learning and how we need to promote learning at the same time, running through everything. So that's a, a formal thank you, and also a formal thank you to Lenka, to um, Helen, to the wonderful Joanna Ty manning the chat for me, and um, to Lisa Foster for doing all the technical support. So thank you so much. We still have close to a thousand people participating in this forum who are moving into the next section where we'll keep on answering questions in a slightly more relaxed way. I don't know if we can be any more relaxed than we already are, but we'll try. So thank you for me. And you're getting lots of love, lots of love in that very fast moving chat. Um, there are a few more questions coming around and there's a couple here. Oh, one question which I think I will put to people, someone from anonymous attendee, usefully, what happens when people in your institution are very uninterested in investigating AI possibilities? And I think this could happen at a lot of levels. It could happen, you know, up. Um, you know, at leadership, or if you're in a department, it could happen quite closely at departmental level, which could be quite stifling as well. Have we got any thoughts about, you know, if you think this is a burning issue, you're listening to this and you've gone, oh, my goodness, I need to be nimble, I need to adapt, but the people around me are not of that view. Anyone want to jump in? I'll, I'll jump in. I think it's about finding something that matters to them and connecting it with that. So for me, something that really matters is assessment. And I am often able to get people to care about something because of its impact on assessment. So that, that's one of my ways in. But you, this is a relational piece. It's about finding things that matter to people. Mm. I, I agree with Phil. I, I also think because it's still an unfolding um, you know, issue, uh, I'm asking myself, to what extent do I need to engage with those people at this moment in time? I, I think at, at this point I'm quite keen to leverage the curious and excited among us because they're the ones who are playing with every tool, thinking about how they can be used across all the different ways that we work, and I, I think we really need to start by kind of gathering their intelligence first, sifting through it to determine what do we want to keep, what's going to be of value to us and, and what do we not need to keep. Um, and then once you've kind of thought through what you want to do at the institutional level to step forward, then I think at that point you need to start bringing everyone along. So are we at the bringing everyone along stage yet? Not sure. To, to me, I think we're still in the investigative exploratory phase, deciding where we want to land as uh, you know in each of our institutions. Yeah, I don't disagree with any of that. I think I think what I've learned through all the different you know sector-wide risks that we've looked at is that it's always patchy. There will always be differing levels of engagement with the risk, differing ability to assuage the risk, um, and and differing levels of interest and resources directed towards it. So there is going to be a need at some point um, for institutions and then probably for the regulator to work out what does what does base look like here and how do we make sure that everyone's at that level at least. Uh, that, that all makes perfect sense to me. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, at some point, it's going to become clear that they can't assure the learning they claim to be teaching. Uh, that's quite a serious state of affairs to be in. Um, and as with anything, there will be early adopters and then a, a slower following curve. Thank you. Um, some good advice. It's always really hard. And it's not the only thing I'm sure that people find themselves in um, conflicting views with the um, department or institution or place they find themselves landed. Um, I There are a couple of questions here one around ChatGPT has been blocked from public school servers in Tasmania, Victoria, New South Wales, Western Australia and Queensland. So why is use of AI content generators allowed at some universities? I'm going to answer that really briefly and say um, because you're not supposed to use it if you're under 18. That would be a really big reason why schools would be blocking it. Um, 
Uh, but then they go on to say, doesn't this bear huge similarities to contract cheating or collusion? Why is using AI to create an assignment view differently to paying someone or creating an assignment for them? And various other people have views about this. Um, and I think we've come to it quite a lot. So in the course of the conversations, but I, I would like to, to ask you to reflect on what you think the line is. You know, clearly there's a line where use is going to be fine and we can all agree on that. But maybe it's endorsed in part of the assignment. And clearly there's a line where it's not okay. You know, you're passing something off that isn't your own. But there's a messy bit in the middle. And I was wondering if you'd all like to reflect on what that messy bit is. Rowena, you've you've unmuted yourself. I'll go to you first. Yeah, I'm really glad. I'm really glad you've kind of interrogated the notion of the line because I, I think we, we talk, often talk about the line. What's the line between collaboration and inclusion? And um, it's always contextual. So it's context specific and situational. Uh, so you know it, it's um, it's it's not something that's easy to describe in a nutshell. Um, I I think um, to me the key difference between these tools and contract cheating is uh, we do need students to learn how to use these tools productively and ethically. We don't want to be encouraging any kind of relationship between a student and a contract cheating provider, but students do need to develop a productive relationship with these tools. So that to me is the key difference, you know, that, that what students need to figure out how to incorporate these things into the way they work productively and ethically. Um, but I, I think the, the messy middle, I think, is what we're still figuring out. Uh, I think that conversation is still unfolding. That is, to what extent are we comfortable, you know, as, a, as assessors, as an institution, as a society, with writing, for example, that is AI-assisted, and to what degree? It depends on the learning outcomes. You know, it it, it, it kind of depends on where we land on this, um, ethically, morally, perhaps. I, I think that's still an unfolding issue, but, but I think that conversation about what, what, what is that messy middle and to what extent are we comfortable with AI-assisted writing is a really, really vital one that, that we need to keep having in the open. I'll jump in on the writing thing there. We had a very sophisticated conversation with our students about this who were pointing out that sometimes the writing is just is simply there for them to demonstrate that they've grasped the ideas, right? And, and the obsession around whether every sentence was handcrafted uh, by them is seems ridiculous, and uh, I'm inclined to agree. You know, increasingly, it may we may be living in a world where your first language is irrelevant. Uh, what we care about is whether you can perform authentically and defend and explain your work when challenged. That means we have to make space for that challenge and authentic performance to happen. That's a challenge in a PAP curriculum. So we could have a very interesting discussion about where we're going to find that time and space for that, that validation of what the students need to be able to do. But whether, you know, X percent was written by me versus X percent written by computational aid, whether it was words, spelling checker, Grammarly's use of GPT, remember Grammarly is now GPT powered, et cetera, et cetera, or sitting there in Google Docs or Microsoft Word as it will be very soon. That for me points us to a future where we're going to look back and think, what a ridiculous conversation we had. What we care about is whether people can write and think, if they can produce a piece of writing that's fit for purpose and they can still think and critically in conversation on their feet, who cares? Who cares how that piece of text came to be? I, I just sort of um, jump on that as well. I really think that idea of being able to have a dialogue about the work is probably going to be where we're going to end up. The thing I was saying about multiple assessments, some of that's got to be synchronous, interactive stuff, could be interactive oral assessment or similar. And yeah, how we got to the, the content in the first place in the context of one of those interactive pieces probably doesn't matter as much as the ability to have a dialogue around it. And I think that's going to be a very authentic thing. If we think about using chat GPT to write a scientific paper, I think we're just going to accept that that's okay in the long term. The thing the scientist is going to have to hold on to is going to be being responsible for this thing that's been put out into the world and being able to 
engage in a dialogue about it and be the owner of the integrity of the piece. I think that's really yeah. going to matter. Right. I mean, what student wants to look a complete idiot when in a conversation it becomes clear they're clueless, right? That is the situation they will find themselves in if they outsource without comprehending. And that's the situation they need to be able, and our assessments need to be good enough to pick that up. I think um, I think Phil touched yeah. on a sorry, Margaret. I think Phil touched on a really interesting example there of a scientific paper because um, if you look at the various AI tools out there right now, it's not unfeasible to think that somebody could put together a scientific paper and they've used AI to do the lit review, to do the data gathering, to do the data analysis, and to do a bit of the writing up. And so, yeah, I think ultimately Phil's right. It is it, if we reach a not too distant future where AI will be helping us with the full workflow of putting together a research paper, then it is ultimately that that individual being accountable for the quality and the robustness of what gets put out there that is the, the key learning outcome more, more than any of the other bits and pieces. Yeah, I think that brings us right around to full circle about how you get people there. So we're all viewing this through our prism of people who came up and developed our content knowledge and our expertise and our experience without these tools, how do we make sure students come through with those? And I think the other thing to keep in mind is I, I agree that the oral assessments and that kind of conversational piece is really important, but when we're think, talking about at the scale of our sector and Australian institutions are enormous by world standards, there's other risks that come up. So, you know, if you're going to have an oral defence of 800 students in a course, how are you going to make sure that those are all marked, you know, in a similar way by 50 different markers? Or are you going to devote four weeks of a 12-week course to the one person doing all of those conversations? So just that we've got to, it comes back to that multiple points and types of assessment. How do we get there in a way that's, that's really holistic? Yeah. I also think it's assuming that orals will hold the weight of grading. We may decouple grading from the conversation. I mean, I've, I've been doing some PhD defences recently for my poor PhD students, and boy, they, they have been defending. They're, they're really under the, under the line um, because I'm doing some European co-supervision. But that's not actually anything more than, at this point, almost a symbolic gesture. They've already passed. But if you couldn't defend it, then everything else gets thrown back in. It doesn't really matter how well they defend it, but they do, they need to be able to talk cogently and coherently. That's kind of like, oh, they're a bit embarrassed. But, you know, it's not a very high bar at that point, it, but it will, if they haven't done the work, it will it will show. So it may, may serve different points. Phil, you look like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just want to jump on the workload thing. I think there's sort mm. of, I, I got two answers for this and they're kind of contradictory ones. The first mm. one is, we can, within our existing workloads, reprioritize what we do. I think we overemphasize what I call assessment security or trying to ensure people have done the work themselves most of the time, and we underemphasize it at moments where it really matters. And I think we might want to reprioritize our resourcing, really look across degrees and identify those key moments of assessment where it really matters. And if we can't resource, a few moments of interactive oral assessment across a degree, I'm really sad. I've I've done it as a, a sessional tutor in one of those mega units before. Yeah. I've done interactive oral assessment with every student in class. So that's one answer. And the other answer is, which is the contradictory one, maybe we need to rethink the, the workload models and actually allocate more of the income that we get from teaching towards assessment where we can really tell what students are capable of. Maybe we're under-resourcing assessment. I'm going to, um, again, take Chair's prerogative and say I think there's a couple of really interesting points there and the issues about writing, I think, I'd like to also point out, add to this and say we haven't talked about line of argument. So people assume that writing is at sentence level, but it's also about crafting an argument and a, and a, and a moment. And to, 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 from what I can see of my extensive use of, um, not that extensive, my playing with the various tools, they're not um, very grand at that. To be honest, humans aren't very good at it either. It takes a lot of work to get there. And it, 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 so I do think that um, there are some things that we, when you... We make some assumptions about writing that are pro probably disciplinarily 
um, joined. And I think a reason people use a scientific paper is it's very genre. The genre is very simple and very easy to use. So I think we need to be aware, aware, aware of our disciplinary assumptions. I can also see here that someone has asked what is Texas' views and industry's views and replacing written assessment with verbal assessments and followed by summary of self-peer evaluation. I feel like we've answered that. So I'm um, going to go to sharing university intellectual property by educators and students with commercial AI companies involves gifting content we do not have rights to. And are uni legal departments coping with the implications of these uses? I think I'm going to move away from legals because none of us are lawyers. Um, and to say, of course, our legal departments are working so hard on this. You, 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 you know, you can never contact them. <laughs> sorry, sorry, lawyers, you're you're wonderful. Um, to actually turn that back to the complexities of data and content and who owns what. Um, it's it is contentious. It's really sticky. Again, um, in that grey area, we'll have to people have thoughts. And Simon, you've, you've unmuted yourself, so I'll open it to you. Yeah, so, I mean, um, one aspect of critical literacy is understanding how ChatGPT came to be, how MidJourney came to be, and understanding the, the you know, frankly, you know, dubious harvesting of, of humans, IP, et cetera. Um, and students need to understand that, you know, AI has got a dark underbelly, the, you know, the, um, the shocking working conditions that people are detoxing chat GPT for us. So we don't have to deal with what it ingested. Um, all of that is part of how this stuff lands on our desktop. Um, so that's one sense of awareness and critical literacy, just, just a very specific thing. It came up around the co-pilot thing, but one thing that when we, if we see this popping up in office, we do at least have the guarantee from a company like Microsoft that that data is not flowing outside of the university instance. It's not being used and shared to train its foundation models, et cetera. There is absolutely no guarantee whatsoever of that sort when you get when you send students off to chat GPT. So the idea that it's embedding into tools that have been licensed and checked for privacy and data security by the university, that's a more secure place to be than random websites out there. So I'll just I'll just make that point. Uh, uh, you know, we we might have different views about the big tech companies, but that's one thing you get when you license a product that has generative AI part of it. I think um, yeah, just picking up on on some of those is slightly different points, but there was, I did notice in the chat before there was quite a few comments when we talked about originally school secondary school expanding it on the basis that um, you had to be 18 to enter into the contract and EdTech responded by saying, well, actually, with parental permission, you can do it at 13. It's not clear to me that that was driven by much more than a fear of, of losing out of market share as opposed to anything about what we do with the data and how transparent we are with what we do with the data. And then, of course, for parents, you know, if the school says we want to be able to use this, so please sign permission, I think there's a lot of pressure to do that and a lot of pressure to say, well, if everyone else in the class is going to be doing it, I better do it too. So I think that's where, you know, the regulation piece that governments are grappling with comes in. We can't just allow ed tech to decide what this should look like and how this should be rolled out and what they should be transparent about. We have to really think through what we want it to look like, what's not just all the possible futures, but what's the future we're aiming towards. I'd, I'd sort of just add in that it's not, it's also not just us. Um, it's going to be a bunch of international sort of players in what I've heard called the private academic support services uh, field, such as, I'm going to put a link in the chat to Chegmate, which is the private academic support service Cheg, and their special chat GPT, which is GPT-4, with all of the homework help that Chegg has ever provided, which is in the order of about a billion items. Um, people would be concerned about some university IP in there as well. It's, it's, it's a big mishmash. It's going to be so hard to regulate in this space. And also, Phil, it comes back to that, you know, when Rowena, when you were talking about the digital divide and making sure there's institutional licences, 
um, that'll be important, but people will also immediately where they can and where they can afford to be buying the Mercedes version of that. You know, people will be opting into a higher model and you will still have a digital divide. So there might be a base level, but um, yeah, I do seriously worry about the equity going forward. Oh, absolutely. If, if I was a student, I'd be using, and this is not an endorsement, but I'd be using a, a chat GPT trained on Chegg's data much more than I'd use one that's just regular chat GPT because it's it's trained up on a whole bunch of people trying to do homework for other people. That's something, th this this training and tuning is a critical issue. Um, you know, the 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 explosion in dot coms using this is because they take the foundation model super expensive to build and then they tune it for that sector deep knowledge of the text and knowledge of the sector potentially tuning the conversations that it has so that it's having the kind of conversation they want with their client whoever that might be we have to learn to do that as universities we have to learn how to tune the foundation model for teaching a particular thing and we need to tune the conversation that it's a learning conversation uh, the kind of thing that Khan Academy have been doing, you know, stop the agent from just answering the question when asked. Do the kinds of things that a, did, a good coach does. And um, we, we need to be sharing that know-how across the sector as fast as possible, not just dependent on the foundation models developed by companies who know nothing about teaching and learning in anything. That's where we're at right now. But every university, especially the IT, data science, AI people, will be across how we do that but that's not yet production capability available for teaching and learning. Um, we're coming to the last sort of nine minutes and I, I, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of questions here, some of which we've half answered here about joining Shona Thompson's question. I think we've talked about employers. I might move to Alistair's question because it's something we haven't talked about. It's interesting, and all our discussion, it seems to me, from memory, has focused on examples drawn from IT, medicine, STEM. I'm interested that these are our default disciplines, um, but HE covers many more areas. Any thoughts on that? So how it is a natural tendency when we talk AI, talk AI to talk science. It seems to be, probably that's where from AI comes to. How do we expand how do we expand and ensure that everyone's kept in? I, I can say at ECU that that actually some of the most um, um, I, I kind of vocal students, but also some of the most active students have been in um, creative arts and humanities. So I've um, in the survey that we did, uh, there were a lot of comments from students in those disciplines saying, I'm really concerned about the ethics of this around creative outputs. Um, uh, I, I, there was a story a, a few months ago of a publisher who'd actually put a pause on all pitches for new books because they were being flooded by terrible pitches from AI and actual authors could not get through <laughs> the system. Um, so, you know, that was an interesting story. Um, but also uh, a group of artists at ECU, um, early career artists at ECU have just uh, launched a few weeks ago, I went to opening night, uh, an art show uh, on generative artificial intelligence. Um, they mm. they'd created original artworks and they'd also created uh, AI-produced artworks as a counterpoint. It was a really fantastic show. It was just engaging directly with AI in the art space and inviting people into a conversation. So, um, yeah, I, I'm seeing just as much engagement in those discipline areas as I am in others, which is which is great to see. Yeah, it's my observation as well that everyone is, is sort of working with it. And I guess it's just, um, you know, we tend to... Um, I think we tend to reflect a lot of people who've worked in AI come from STEM disciplines, so they do tend to sort of reflect a little more in that in that space. Um, I'm going to skip to uh, a, a down the uh, line here. I think this is an interesting question from Will Armour. Any comments about how we handle using ChatGPT for learning within the constraints of what we know already about you know, how humans learn, such as cognitive load, load theory? So... Um, where are the intersections with learning theory about um, with with these sorts of uses of generative AI? 
I'll, I'll take a, a little cognitive load theory one. Mm-hmm. So um, one of the, the aspects of cognitive load theory is that for any given task, there's cognitive load that's intrinsic to the task and, and good for learning and you can't remove it from the task without really changing it. And then there's cognitive load that is extraneous to the task, which is you know the, the busy work, the stuff that we we give to students because to do the, the intrinsic bits, you kind of have to do this other stuff. Um, and for me, a nice sort of uh, razor that we might try to apply is trying to find the bits of extraneous cognitive load and see if we can offload those to the, the Gen AI. I don't think there's too much that's that scary about doing that. We already do this sort of cognitive offloading with students with things like referencing software. We, we don't force students to do referencing by hand, except when we really want that. Most of the time we let them do it with the tools. So yeah, intrinsic, what's core to it, extraneous, what might we be able to offload? And it'll be different for different learning outcomes. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on this one? Yep. Okay. I think that we're pretty much at the close here. The last couple of questions, <laughs> there are a couple of questions like, is AI an overhyped mess, a calculator moment of tech shift, a Gutenberg press moment of cultural shift? Um, I think there was a question here about um, what is the point of university? I can't find it now. What is the point of university anyways, if we can, if we can do all these things? Um, so I thought a last close question would be, um, any reflections on is this an existential crisis moment for the sector? Um, how much do you really think is at stake here? You know, nice, easy one to end off with. Uh, I'll, I'll just end by saying something controversial just, just for some reason. Um, look, I think if, if we don't grapple with it meaningfully as a sector, then I think we are at risk of being viewed as bachelors of optional attendance. I think we have to be really clear on what the value proposition is for the learner and for the public and make that out clearly because it's not just about the reality, it's about people's point of reference and what they think university is for. And we need to make sure that the, the quality and the reputation is maintained. Um, okay, I'll jump in. I, I think I think this is an inflection point. Um it's been coming a long time. There's been a lot of warnings about AI. I'm not an AI doomer, but um, you don't have to be an AI doomer to want to see our citizens develop a lot of smarts about how they engage with AI. Um, this generative AI stuff is so seductive because we are wired evolutionarily to engage in conversation, to form attachments, to see a mind behind coherent conversation. And that's very seductive. And, um, you know, we're talking about higher ed here, but how our children are going to form attachments to these um, agents is going to be an area of extraordinary uh, importance, you know, thinking thinking about what's going to be going on in schools and, and children's development as well. And that's something, you know, um, I would say, you know, AI is closing that cognitive gap with humans. And we have to move to higher ground. Um, if we don't move to higher ground, then you, you, your job is at high risk of automation. So we have to teach students how to think and think ethically. And some colleagues are talking about not just what you know, but how you are about being, not just about knowing. And it's about being that's distinctively human, very, very different from machines. That's something that needs to come back into our higher ed, I think. Yeah, I I agree with with both Helen and Simon. I, I think um, for hundreds of years, universities have in part been been about um, graduating people who are not just good thinkers, but people who are also good citizens. I, I think we we need to keep that in in view in this moment. What does it mean to be a good citizen, a good human at this moment in time? Uh, I do think this uh, will be given. Given the impact, as, as Phil said, you know, the impact of AI on the way that we currently assess and the ability for AI to do quite a lot of our assessment, 
Uh, I think this is pr- the biggest challenge that the sectors face, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, I do think we've got to confront it pretty head on. Uh, and, and I do think it will require a degree of change that we, we need to really prepare ourselves for. I think it will be a pretty significant scale of change over the next few years uh, that, that we need to, we, we will just need to undertake. I think it's inevitable. Um, I agree with I agree with everyone. I, I think we need to fundamentally rethink how we assess or else we won't fulfill our contract with society. And one thing we haven't talked heaps about here, we also want to set tasks for students that they want to do. And we need to really deeply engage with what does that look like in this new world? Thank you so much. The chat is saying this is the best panel yet. And I feel like I certainly I feel like it is um, been really an enjoyable conversation. I'm going to end on my two cents worth of this piece. I think in higher ed, we are blessed with the opportunity to contribute as well. We are, I think we are in an inflection point, but our work is a lot of the things that larger language models can't do. And so we're so lucky to be in this space because what we offer is originality. We offer doing things that haven't been done before, which is a little bit problematic for, you know, stuff that's based on a corpus of already defined work. How lucky are we as well? So an optimism to add to the inflection point as well too. I think it's, I think some sectors will have it harder than ours, even though we are in the firing line, it may feel like at the moment. Um, so thanks once again. Gorgeous discussions and very quick reminders. Um, we've got another session coming up on the 18th of July, which will be about, um, about research. What does this mean for research? We have a cradle seminar as well about authentic assessment on the 12th of July, if anyone um, would like to attend that. Also fantastic. And um, big thanks to Texa um, for, for, for supporting this. Um, great to have, um, you know, uh, you in our corner as we battle with the um, this challenge of perhaps, I mean, as Rowena said, in my lifetime, in our, one of them at any rate, maybe a bit older than you, Rowena, in our lifetimes at any rate. Thanks again. And um, uh, I will, um, um, we'll, we'll close down the formal, formal webinar now. Thank you very much all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.